All children are born artists. The problem is to remain an artist as we grow up. What about art? We have art in order not to perish from the truth. Welcome to the Cool Art Center. Uh, I'm John Handley, I'm the director here, and I'm with the artist John Cobb uh, tonight for the closing interview for Vision and Substance, The Art of John Cobb. Uh, but you had uh, fairly significant formal art instruction at a young age. Yeah, um, I, I knew what I was going to do a long, long time ago, and uh, my mom was very supportive. So I went to this place called the Texas School of Fine Arts at uh, age seven. And there was this uh, real, real fat Norwegian guy named Charles Norman. And he had this uh, old home on University Avenue. It's long since been torn down. And uh, it was so beautiful, man. But there was uh, quite a few drawbacks I had. I lost every Saturday. Everybody else got to do stuff, and I had to go to art school. <laughs> but it was, it was so memorable. At the time, I didn't know what I was doing. And I hope I do now. <laughs> <laughs> but it was the, the, the roof had leaked and formed all these brown clouds. And the walls were packed up with Arizona highways and plaster casts and junk. And he did paintings of the Texas heroes of the Alamo. And, you know, Davy Crockett and everybody. And, you know, we, you know, his work wouldn't, you know, it was good. I mean, he would, I would work on a painting and he would work on it. And I would just marvel at how he could render this stuff, you know. And so I learned by watching him instead of doing it myself. And uh, it was a great experience. And I, my fellow student's name was Nub Wimberly. And Nub and I would go every, <laughs> every Saturday and uh, do that. So that worked until we moved. My dad worked for John Conley. And when he was out of office, then he became a banker down at Corpus. And I had lessons with uh, jo Joseph Kane, who was an abstract squeegee, squeegeeist. I don't know how you say that exactly. But he used squeegees and made these paintings. And that, that was, we spent most of the time painting out of the National Geographic. And uh, Randy Flowers was there. He was, he since was the department head there at Del Mar. I don't know if he's still there or not. And uh, so after Joseph Kane was Gibbs Milliken at the University of Texas. And I worked with Gibbs and got to know him very personally. And we'd, I would go to his home and have dinner. And we would go to the rodeo. And he, we had a lot of fun. And he was a very colorful fellow. And he's deceased too, so. Uh, and then I made a big step. I went to Rhode Island School of Design. And how old were you then? Uh, let's see. I was uh, 20, maybe 20, 19, maybe. And boy, I was just out of water up there. So I gave it up. I said, you know, I'm not learning that much. I'm, my dad and I are spending a lot of money. So I took the money and went to Europe mm -hmm. and uh, bought a Vespa over there and traveled around on that Vespa for about a year. Mm -hmm. Going to museums, doing watercolors. It's a great education. One of the best. You know, the King Ranch people, uh, 
owned a ranch in southern Spain. So I got to go down there and um, at the foreman's house in Sevilla there, and uh, somebody ripped off my suitcase, man. So <laughs> I lost everything, man. My papers, my camera, about 15 rolls of film. You know, eight months of work. And uh, so I was kind of bummed about that. But in the end, it was better because when I went to Morocco, I didn't have all that stuff. And I know I would have lost it down there. <laughs> <laughs> but you were really influenced by uh, the old masters. Yeah, you know, I was one of those Wyatt, Andrew Wyatt buffs uh, from, you know, from age 12 on. I just, and I actually called him one time. Uh, no, it was Guy Morrow that called him and said, Mr. Wyatt, I'm having trouble with my paintings, though. The roaches are eating it. What should I do? And Wyeth goes, you need to move, son. <laughs> <laughs> but I did write him a letter. But uh, he didn't say too much. He was pretty old then. But I always liked him. When I went over to Europe, I saw all those paintings of Prado. Wrecked my scooter right there in front of the Prado. It was so good. <laughs> <laughs> but I did, I learned a lot from them. And you know, I was so out of touch at Disney, I was just phenomenally out of touch. So uh, I was not really a very modern person, you know. Are, are you now? No. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember you telling me you were very impressed with like Velasquez. Yeah, absolutely. There's one room there in the Prado, and it's just a gallery with those stand-up portraits, you know, of the dwarves and the, and the drunkards. Extraordinary work. So, after your, what, a year in Europe about? Yeah. Um, you came back to Port Aransas. Yeah, I kind of come to the, uh, uh, I think there's a description on one of those about how things had kind of come to an end. And uh, I was, I don't know if I was starting over or just giving up, you know, but it seemed like a good place and I wasn't bothering anybody. And there were quite a number of other people who had similar feelings. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Port Rangers is uh, extremely changed now. It's, uh, it's a robust tourist town, even in the winter. But in those years, it was pretty isolated. I, I liked it, but I don't know how much I learned there. And you know, I actually want to pause and backtrack a bit because you had a very important experience in Spain, uh, which I, I'd really appreciate you talking about. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if it was a dream or a vision. Uh, yeah, uh, there was this one a uh, little uh, hostel that I had in Sevilla. It was on the roof. It was about nine flights up. And uh, I had this real vivid dream kind of thing. And uh, I mean, I, I still remember it. It's just, uh, and one of the ways that I know I remember it was that when I woke up in the morning and it was still before my eyes, everyone in the street was like, you know, real courteous to me, wanted to know if I was all right. <laughs> As though this kind of vision was something that happened to people in that country. And I, I rather think that it has happened. Mm -hmm often. And um, some of the great mystics come from Spain. I think it must be true. Mm -hmm. And so I had not really uh, been a Christian or believed in very much. And uh, I began to realize that, uh, well, I guess initially how ignorant I was. And then to 
to try and put the pieces, you know, in an isolated area kind of back together again and uh, eventually it, it, it worked out and the little chapel in Port Aransas kind of solidified that, you know, made it into uh, something I could really reach out and see and do. And I had some good advice from a friend, Glenn Francis, and so uh, we uh, we managed to do okay. And now this this was the first chapel that you did um, yeah. in the seventies, correct? Late seventies. Seventies. Yeah. And uh, there there is a photograph of it in the um, in the catalog, and it's very different a very different work from what we have here today. Yeah, I don't I can't really explain the change. Uh, I, I think that uh, I became more interested in how the world looks to everyone. In other words, it's a real person in real space in a particular time. And yet, uh, there is something about it that has always happened. So, I was I wanted to portray the objective world. I really did not like, you know, I even admit to the fact that I didn't like myself very much. And it was very difficult to get over that, you know, uh, to, so I just began to work on the world that everyone sees, that everyone knows, that we ought to know better. And, of course, that's completely anti-modern, so I don't know where I am. <laughs> but it is something that, you know, that I do in the present chapel that is more mature than the earlier work, which is just a pure expression of joy of having been released from this problem and of wanting to say it like a child, you know. Like a child would say. It's so, very lyrical that yeah. the first chapter is. Mm -hmm. And why a chapel? Well, um, you know, it was actually, when you're doing a thing, you don't always know where it is you're going with it. Mm -hmm. So I started one at St. Edward's, because I came back, left Port Aransas, went to the Holy Cross Brothers at St. Edward's, got a room in the old place where they used to quarter, which was now turned into the art department, and developed relationships with those guys, uh, relationships that have been extremely important to me. Uh, I think there's several of those brothers in some of these paintings. Mm -hmm. and uh, kind of got screwed, put my head back on and, you know, got with it. And so, uh, what was the question? <laughs> Why a chapel? So, I started with one, I did another, and then I realized, hey, let's just do a bunch of these, you know, or, John, let's just, <laughs> because I've always considered it like in a room with the person you're doing, you know? It's not like some isolated event where what you're doing uh, is what, how you see it. I think about the person. The more I think about them, the more I realize what they're like. And you can translate that. At least you, that's what you're trying to do. You're translating that person the way I see them. And uh, so that's the aim. And since it worked into a series, it was great. Well, I'm not going to sell these. We're going to keep them all together. And so that was the, the answer for it. So, so the current chapel uh, that we have here, uh, you have been working on now for how long? Since 1983. It's quite a while. And 80, 81. 81. And uh, 
What's your final vision for it? You know, uh, someone approached me earlier, hey, I know a great building in Austin, you know, with the Episcopal Church, and set the visibility is low. Or, hey, I know a monastery in San Cristobal near uh, San Angelo, and uh, so I went to check that out. Anything I get, any nugget of news or desire, I'll consider. Because it's really a kind of testimony, no longer just of my work as an artist. It's really a kind of, uh, it's a kind of an American uh, view of the best of who we are. I, I don't know if that's true, but that's, that's the endeavor of it. And so it's free, man. It's all free. So, of course, there's a lot, you know, I can't tell Cheryl Vogel, oh, it's free, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I will tell her, because we've got to find something that's going to work for it, you know. And, uh, and if it involves, uh, you know, Cheryl's uh, having to... Uh, you know, lobby for this or that, or a building, or an architect, or, you know, I just don't know. I, all I know is that this is my part of it. Mm -hmm. And um, it's not through yet, so I'm not dead yet. And it's starting, I was worried, man, it started to get stale here. <laughs> and because you work on something that long, you know, and you just, it's not good for it. So. I'll come back, I'll, I'll pray about it, I'll, I'll work on it during Holy Family Week, <laughs> which was a couple of weeks ago, or last week, and I'll do all kinds of things, because every day you wake up and you go, oh man, it's another day. <laughs> but you get over it, you know, you deny yourself, you get going, and, and sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't, but it's a, it's a constant thing. I don't get that old. I mean, it doesn't get so old that I can't do it, because I'll go out and do these landscapes on the spot and, you know, do them pretty quickly and with a lot of fun. So, you know, I'm not uh, lamenting it. I'm just saying, you know, it is a dedicated work, and, and you have to answer for it. Mm -hmm. What I find unique uh, when I'm sitting in the chapel is that I'm looking at faces that are very familiar to me. I, I, I love, for example, the depositions that you have in there, and on one of them, as they're bringing the body of Christ off the cross, there's a digital wristwatch on one of the yeah. arms. It reminds me of what the Renaissance painters were doing when they were dealing with biblical narrative, and they were putting them in the costumes of their day. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, you get this nostalgic sense, you know, that, oh, well, you know, if you're ever doing a biblical painting, well, you know, if you're lucky, it looks as good as something Rembrandt did, or, you know, Van Eyck, or the Gimp altarpiece. Mm. Or, so you get this idea, and everybody has this idea, but the reality is that the quality of the gospel that isn't relegated to a time. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why people feel like it ought to be, because that's just not the nature of it. And so, for that matter, I'm not sure it's relegated to a denomination, you know. I don't think it is, but sometimes we think it is. So, it's it's kind of a it's kind of a hope for chapel that's you know inclusive and diverse and you know all that good stuff. So if it has to do with somebody presently, why you know that's all the better.
It's nice, though, to be able to work on these things on one's own, you know, in one's own space. And, uh, and it's really, you know, all these icons, they have this nostalgic thing, oh, you know, you do this prayer and you use these certain colors. Well, I agree with all that. But each person has got to do it, you know. And so for me to have that space, to be able to do that work, to have people help around the house, to have a wife who cares for me and, and fixes meals. I mean, that is so great to me. And there's, there's, there's no reason to believe that this painting is any, worth anything more than those things. Because these things need to move, you know. They need to be part of people's lives and people need to be seen. They need to be understood. And uh, so that's the deal, you know. Hmm. How would you say um, your landscapes relate or don't relate um, to your chapel series? Well, you know, the chapel thing is a dedicated work, like I was saying, and the paintings are just stuff I, I want to do. That's how I started out at age seven, doing pictures of the dockyard with Charles Norman. Mm -hmm. And I liked doing that. And I didn't think that art was going to be like it is. But, man, you grow up and... It's just an inexhaustible arena, man. And that's one of the great things about it is that I don't have to be a priest. I don't have to be tied to any kind of doctrine. And it's such a free and expensive desire that I just can't believe more people don't do it. <laughs> uh, in the chapel, uh, you, you have a self-portrait of yourself portrayed, um, I think, as uh, St. Francis. No, it's Brother Leo, because Brother Leo is the person who chronicles St. Francis. You got it. That's right. Remember? Yes. So, uh, and what's the relationship there for you with St. Francis? Well, you know, there is... And it's, it's a, a real, real dilemma, dilemma, this balance that we have. Uh, and Niesel and I were talking about it on the way up, because nature seems like, man, I mean, it can be the most terrible place, and yet it can be the most beautiful place. Mm. <coughs> and uh, where, is, where is nature in all of this, you know? I mean... Mesol thinks that it started out good, which it did, and then it sort of got transported uh, after the willful choice, you know. And the secondary result of that is this sort of dysfunction, you know. I mean, I'm working on the Holy Family and I'm seeing films like, uh, what's that thing, Richland Estates that was on PBS the other night mm. about dysfunctional families. <laughs> and you just think, well, you know, where is nature in all this? I mean, how complex do we have to make it? You know, it's very difficult. And uh, so a lot of people have just totally separated and said, you know, we are going to live on our own like the Carmelite sisters that I knew, or no, or we are just going to uh, forget about it, or we're just going to act like we don't care. Let's just throw our stuff on the side of the road. Let's just run over the possums, you know? So I think of St. Francis, and I think, you know, gosh, I am not. I, what was it called? Brother, son, sister, mm -hmm. movie. It's fabulous movie. Mm -hmm. But it's a lot of fun, and you know, you think to yourself, oh, you know, I'm going to have a picnic in a wheat field. Well, you know, watch out for the fire ants. <laughs> because it's, you know, 
I love Francis, but I have to literally say to myself, you know, we have got to move on. You know, we have we have got to uh, we have got to realize something to help us uh, fix this stuff. You know, and I think we can do it. Uh, and it's, you know, it's wonderful to think of the discipline and the requirements of being someone like Francis. I, I could never do that. But I have seen people who can. Yeah. You have a little a wonderful quote in here, which I probably won't be able to pull out real quick, but where you, you said that St. Francis is a friend of yours. You're not sure if, if you're his friend. But yeah. <laughs> I think that's probably true, but I do know I have this one stick that I use for a straight line, and it's not exactly straight, but it's pretty straight. There's some sort of Jewish ceremony where they carry some palm branch that has to be utterly straight. Does anyone know what that is? Well, this one is not completely straight, but every time I use it, I say, St. Francis, I'm going to use your ruler. And, and I use it for the horizon, especially since the horizon is not really flat, you know. It's a round globe. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, why don't we um, take a few questions from the audience? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, the significance of the building, is that the same one as in the room between heaven and earth and the lumber? The oh. building is an old icon, one of the first. Uh, it was made in Russia. It was the portrayal of the temple in heaven. So, In the middle of that is a picture of the lamb with a wound in its side on a throne. And in my particular icon, there is a sort of primordial landscape in the courtyard of the building. And the lamb is upon a rock that looks sort of like crazy nature, you know? So he is, his throne is no longer, you know, to me, this is my interpretation, no longer a regimented chair. Rather, it's the lamb overcoming that primordial nature, which is the throne, uh, his throne. So, uh, the place, let's see, my wife and I took a journey to El Cielo. It's the most northern cloud forest. Has anyone been there? It's the most northern cloud forest. It's outside Ciudad Victoria. There is a rugged mountain road that goes up through uh, these different kinds of plants. Are you talking about Haumave? Say again. Haumave? It's just south of Victoria, like 35 minutes south. Yeah, I think that's it. Mr. Serrano knows it. And so in the picture, if you look closely, you could see the horse and my wife on the journey on the road. And I guess nobody really sees it because it's so disguised. But <laughs> that, that's, that's what it's, it's in there. Because it's a journey. Any other questions? Yeah. Lumber? Lumber, sorry? There's, there's lumber all in the background of the picture. Yeah, it's junk, man. That's all my junk. <laughs> all my garbage. I'm trying to get rid of that before I take that journey, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right, Niesel? <laughs> yes, go ahead. Do you have a favorite piece in the chapel? 
Uh, you know, my favorite piece is the one that's most popular, which happens probably is the little girl on the pony. Probably. The, this one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's not favorite just because I like it. It's because y'all like it. So it's my favorite. That's why I put it on the cover. No. Oh. <laughs> Dream of a Friend. The, where he's comforting the sister. The oh, that's sister. right. The Dream of a Friend. Yeah, that's a really horrific story. And, and I read the, the book the, the, that John wrote, um, but I wondered if maybe you might have something to add to that. Um, yeah, it's a rather tragic story. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, the young man in the picture in the road mm -hmm. was hit by a lumber truck. Mm -hmm. And uh, is that in the story? Mm -hmm. oh. Some of it is. Okay. But, but, but go ahead. And uh, he lost all his smell and his taste, but he still lives. And he married a, a, a gal there in Mississippi where they live. And his sister, uh, who is a writer, told the tale of the third brother who was killed. And, uh, you know, in Fort Worth, uh, there was a real sort of, I mean, the Baptist seminary is there. Is, there's really a, a quite, quite a line that goes through that city, or I did at one time. And, um, it was probably summed up in many of the Protestant ministers that spoke at that time. And that division uh, was very serious. So the child was going off into so-called, uh, what do they call it, uh, bewitched, a bewitched uh, evil state. And the father was going off into, you know, the pastor role of goodness and glory. And somewhere down the middle, there's the brother that's wounded and the sister who's trying to put the pieces together. And uh, I'm trying to think of some kind of solution for this. And uh, so this uh, poet Rumi came forth, you know. Who was himself trying to hold the world together in the dance? And uh, they developed this uh, dancing dervish who spins around on the mm -hmm. circle and talk about God not as not as Jonathan Edwards God or not as the What's the other group? Uh, I forget. Anyway, so there, Rumi is seeing God as someone who is a friend of yours. And to me, it was the answer to this crazy way in which we have developed uh, our own ideas about uh, stuff, you know? I don't think Fort Worth is nearly as bad as it used to be. <laughs> <laughs> and, go ahead. Yes. Y yeah, you're right here. Well, my favorite painting is the one in the Jenner the Chaplets on the line, and it's called Baptism by Five. Yeah? Um, Why? I think one reason is because I love your um, etchings in the, in the, the nature, and it's so evocative of Shell Creek and yeah. around Austin. Do you, are you from Austin? No, but oh. I spent a lot of time there. Yeah. And, but it also has the um, sort of religious interest that I like a lot. Yeah. But I was curious what your thoughts were when you painted the girl in red with the pinata. Yeah. What's the pinata? And, uh -huh. um, 
And you also made a statement, or it was in the in the, in the there, about the paint not doing fire. Yeah. The way you wanted it to. Could you just talk about that a little bit? Yeah, you know, I had so much trouble, and I did everything, I, technically speaking, to realize that force, you know, and it just was just faltering miserably. <laughs> so I personified it into the little girl. And uh, it was, uh, at first, you know, you think to yourself, oh, you know, I'm going to make this fantastic landscape, and then I'm going to put this prophet of old, you know, in gowns and pronouncements. And I thought, no, no, that's not how it is, man. It's like a child. It's like a child that can change and who delights in life. So that's that's the person. There was a really cute gal named Valerie, and uh, we would have these Easter's on the Colorado. Why we had hundreds of people come for this picnic, and we would have Easter egg hunt. And Hispanic families, you know, are extraordinarily large, and they would all come, you know, and everybody would bring their pits, and we did it like 11 years in a row until uh, the redneck son-in-law drove us off. <laughs> <laughs> but it was cool. And so during those times, you know, I feel like I'm a spy half the time because I've always got to look out for what's going on really, you know. And I saw Valerie, and so I said, Valerie, we're just going to take some pictures of you and the piñata. So, you know, is that okay? Well, yeah, you know. But they don't pay any attention to you, which is real cool. I know in other ones, when I was trying to get the Santa Nino, I said, we were doing the face painting on the kid's face. I said, you know, I love my design I did on your face. Do you mind if I take a picture of it? Oh, okay. <laughs> because as soon as you tell the kid you're going to take his picture, you know, he's a different kid. <laughs> so, you got to kind of catch them like that, you know. Those, after all, are just minnows. <laughs> yes, sir. Beautiful women. Very difficult. Um, there's such a concept out there, and I have labored on the face of Mary for this holy family thing for two years. <clears throat> I have nearly had it, and I still can't get it. So that's the most difficult uh, personage to properly. I mean, there are so many associations. There's, the room is crowded, you know. And, you know, you get the kid's reaction. Well, what do you think of my painting? Oh, it's all right. And he's right. <laughs> it's only all right. <laughs> so you keep, you know, you keep working at it. But as soon as it becomes a slavish thing, well, you really have lost it. So uh, it's very difficult. I actually found a beautiful model. And uh, if I could only render the thing as beautiful as that, why, well, I would be happy. Howard, yeah. Uh, I'm intrigued by baptism by water. Uh -huh. I really like that. You know, to have all these people from different walks of life, and they're they're making their way to the water. And there's the uh, John the Baptist figure, I'm guessing, uh, the loudmouth surfer. As you yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but in the back, there's uh, there's that naked couple. Yeah. Adam and Eve. So if you covered this in the book already. Forgive me, but. Um, Say more about what you're thinking in the baptism of Adam and Eve, if that's what's happening. What were you saying? There? Well, you know, I think I discussed briefly how the secondary uh, aspect of nature, once Adam and Eve leave, so it's sort of a return to that, 
to that place where nature becomes, you know, a place of uh, redemption, cleanliness, and purity, you know. Uh, but also associated with that is, is dying. And uh, one of my friends in the picture is actually named Jonah. And the guy in the far right-hand corner bending down, who is actually a very, very good surfer, is named Jonah. So he's in the picture. And Glenn Francis, the guy that I initially had these talks with in Port Aransas, that's his son. So I like to use people, you know, like Wes Beck, who's the loudmouth guy. You're thinking, oh, man, this guy, if this guy was attached to the church, just, <laughs> gosh, can you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's, uh, so it's kind of like uh, Austin at one time was hippie hollow. I've been there. Yeah. Well, you're a pastor, is that right? Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> I, I haven't been all my life. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I grew up in Austin, so. <laughs> so, so it's kind of neat, you know, to think of nature and to realize how fantastic and beautiful it really is. And when I was baptized with another child uh, who had been... Uh, hit, I don't know if she had a big scar across her face, but so I began that for me and then finally did the picture with my friends in the picture who are all, you know, watermen. Uh, they, they love that painting in Corpus because it's all people that, you know, everybody knows down there. I think we'll take one final question. No more. <laughs> yes. Excluding the chapel, as you look around the walls, are there particular paintings here that are um, more significant to you than perhaps some of the others? Uh, you know, gee, uh, I, I'm sorry. I'm just, uh, Byron, I'm kind of like on the move with my stuff. And... I absolutely do the best I can on each thing as it comes before me. But I still anticipate uh, doing something that uh, I just am proud of or something, but I don't really pick anything out that much uh, that is just... Uh, super, you know, need or something I just love. I, I like everything. I really do. Um, I like I like the work that I can keep it contained until, you know, and and to be able to add to it. You know, and that's kind of a good feeling. That's probably the best thing I have going. Because not every artist gets a chance to do that. They, they do their work, they sell it, you know, it's gone. Uh, but it's certain that uh, I've spent many days at that jetty right there, that picture of yours, and uh, I have great memories of it. Uh, and I continue to go out there and do work. I'm trying to get this guy named Robbie Felder, who has a gallery in Puerto Aransas, to go out on his, you know, they have this stand-up paddleboard thing. I don't know if y'all have done that. So I said, hey, man, if, uh, if you get this commission, they want a painting of the sea, go out there on your paddleboard, get a waterproof camera, get one of those GoPros or something, <laughs> and paddle out on the outside third bar on a super big, gray, ugly day and just take a bunch of pictures for me. Uh, because what I really like is being like in the water, you know, seeing it. And the jetties is kind of like that, you know, so.
Yeah, that's a cool picture. I like that picture. Good, good bye. <laughs> <laughs>